Okay, hello everyone and welcome. My name is Willie German and I'm your facilitator for this conference. I'd like to thank you all for attending the first Muskegon Community College annual Men of Color Achievement Conference. We are excited to have you and we thank you for joining us today. I'd like to start out by having you take a look at your program. As you can see, exactly what's on the program and the agenda, who's going to be speaking today. And as you open it, if you want to take notes, we have a page for our notes. And if you want to take notes while these speakers are speaking. And uh, as you look at our panel here, I'd like you to know that we have a dynamic keynote speaker today, and his name is Mr. Ja Jaquan Hawkins. Along with our distinguished panel of professional men of color, on our panel we have today MCC President Dr. Dale Nasberry. We have MCC Provost Executive Vice President Dr. John Selman. We have the Honorable Judge Gregory Pittman and MCC Department Coordinator of Foreign Language Ismael Enriquez. And also joining us we have Muskegon Heights Chief of Police, Dr. Joseph E. Thomas. Now at this time, I know it's early in the morning, so we want to kind of loosen you guys up. Everyone seems like they're kind of tired and tensed up. So I'm going to bring to you um, Mr. Eddie Sanders, Jr., who is a community activist organizer. And uh, if you'd like to give him a hand as he comes up. And we'd like for you to enjoy yourself, sit back and engage, and as Mr. Sanders approaches the uh, floor. Come on, somebody say we're here to stay. We're here to stay. Oh yeah, we're gonna wake up, we're gonna make some noise. Somebody say we're here to stay. Yeah, come on, put your hands together for yourself. Yes, 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 yes. I got this call from Brother Willie, and it was music to my ears to know that people are gonna come together and assemble early on a Friday morning. And see, this is, isn't the first time that people have assembled to make something happen to bring change. I'm a walker, I gotta get out here with y'all. Right, first of all, I'm Elder Eddie Sanders Jr. I'm a community activist, organizer, a graduate of this great facility, MCC. Come on, we can do it again. Yeah, get them hands, wake them hands up and a future graduate of GVSU. And last but not least, I'm an apostolic preacher, so if I get to going, somebody reel me in. I'm gonna try to behave, Judge Pittman, I'm gonna try to behave, but I'm excited to be here with the great people this morning. Yes, it's good to see everyone here on assignment. You all don't know it, but you're on assignment. In 1828, there was a brother by the name of Nat Turner. Nat Turner was a slave. Nat Turner, in 1828, he got a vision, he said. And he was sick and tired of being sick and tired. He was tired of being whipped. He was tired of his women, the women, being raped and mangled and, and murdered. So he assembled. He brought people together. And three years later, in 1831, it was a call to action. See, it's good to come together and talk. It's good to come with, come with every solution in the, in the barbershop or on Facebook, but it's a different thing when you put your boots on the ground and make it happen. And he made that call, and in 1831, they took down 55 to 65 slave masters because somebody had to do something. Somebody say, do something. Do uh, Y'all ain't loud enough. Somebody say, do something. Do something. We have to do something. And they did something, because that's all they knew to do. What happened behind that? They said, we're going to cancel their right to assembly. Because they understood that when these people get together with one accord, they're going to cause us damage. We got to pass a law that you can't get together. Matter of fact, they also took the guns from them. We want to keep them suppressed and oppressed. But we kept on marching. We kept on moving forward. Somebody say, stay the course. Stay the course. We have to stay the course. 
No matter what ad uh, adversity comes against us, whatever walls are built, or whatever doors are trying to be slammed in our face, we have to keep making steps, progress in small increments. We have to do it, that's the call. That's the assignment. On this morning, as I look at each and every one of you, the young brothers, these, give these brothers a hand with the bow ties. And this whole section of our young people. George Benson said the young people are our future. Teach them well and do what? Let them lead the way. You all are going to do great, I see it. This is a wonderful occasion on this morning to be here. Because of what that Turner did, they did later on Martin Luther King. Why is he marching? That's not going to accomplish anything. He's wasting his time. But he was steady moving forward. Steady moving forward. We're no longer slaves. Steady moving forward. We can assembly again. Steady moving forward. What? We can vote now? We're steady moving forward. 40 years. President Barack Obama. We're steady moving forward. I wish somebody put their hands together. I feel that. Somebody should feel it with me. Because we keep moving forward. We keep moving forward. And I encourage each and every one of you to continue moving forward. Whatever your goals and aspirations in life may be, they are attainable. Only way you don't attain it if you quit. Somebody say, I'm not a quitter. <laughs> See, there, you might ask me, why do I keep saying, say this, say this? Because there's power in your words. Whatever you say, you can bring it to pass. If you say, I can't do it, guess what? You won't do it. You killed yourself. You shut your own door. But if you say, I can do all things. That's that preacher. I got that. You're supposed to reel me in, Judge, right there. But we can do all things that we put our mind to. Also, I'm going to sit down. On June 10th, we will convene on Rowan Park with the second 2,000-man unity march that I organized with the help of many others. On uh, last year, it was a great success. Uh, we had between seven and 900 people came from all over Muskegon County. Because I believe all people, this is called men of color. But if you open a crayon box, you see a white crayon in there. That's a color. You see a yellow crayon, you see a brown crayon. Those are colors. So we're all people moving with the same agenda. Last year, it was success. It was on uh, the documentary, The New Heights, Restoring the City. Many, many of you may have saw that. Several hundred thousand people saw it. And I believe a lot of people are gonna call, make a call to action. They're gonna be a part of it this year because we won't change. Chief Thomas, we won't change. We all do. You all are looking for change, that's why you're here. You're looking for hope. You're looking for that glimmer. You're looking for that light. That's why we're here. And I'm excited to see each and every one of you. Because I said, that's another person who decided to be somebody. If you decide to be somebody, let me see your hand. Oh, OK, well, look at these distinguished. Come on, put your hands together, young people, for this distinguished panel. I want to thank Willie for inviting me because I'm just in awe to get the call. Can I just testify for one minute? I want to encourage somebody. I'm not, I'm, I'm not afraid of my past. My message, not my message. And, and I see the distinguished chiefs and presidents and judges and distinguished people who have a proven track record. Educated men. Public service personified on a high level. And who gets the mic first? A brother who made horrible decisions in life. Raised up in a great family. For we are a product of our choices. Whether good or bad, there's a check, there's a wage for that. You're going to have to pay for that. And I made a lot of horrible decisions. Just want to know what is that like? And I paid for it. That's why 30 years later, I got my degree from MCC. I still got it. Because I didn't give up. 
Some of you are going to face adversity. Don't give up. Some of you are going to make horrible decisions, totally out of your character, but don't give up. Because you have a future. You have a hope. You have a purpose. You have a destiny that no one can, nobody, no one can stop me because I continue to move forward. That put me in the room with great men. You're next. For the last time, tell somebody, you're next, you got next. You got next. You're on deck for greatness. And with that, I invite you to the second unity march on June 10th, the second Saturday in June at Rowan Park. It's going to be epic. You don't want to miss it. Now, can, I'm going to ask you now, who will be there? Who will come to the unity march and do your part? to make Muskegon County a, the best county in Michigan. Let me, wave your hand, we don't have to be afraid. You can just lie if you don't, just wave it and lie. <laughs> Say, I, just, I don't care, just keep it moving. <laughs> but, I, but I do, I welcome you and I ask you to be there. It'll be a great event, it's still progress. We're making progress this morning. Thank each and every one of you. Come on, give this panel another hand. <laughs> give Willie a hand. The people who have organized this great event. And give me a hand, why not? I thank you, you all have a great day. Love you. Thank you. Appreciate it. Good job, man. All right, all right let's give Mr. Sanders another hand, y'all. Okay, moving forward. Okay. The purpose of this Men of Color Achievement Conference is to engage students in their education and focus on barriers that encounter in the completion of college education. We are doing this by bringing together successful professionals to speak and serve as role models who will share their personal stories. This is to influence high school and college students in attendance to overcome these obstacles develop leadership skills, and to understand the importance of cultivating a support network to help them attain their goals. I want to empower you and encourage you to continue to be achievers. A quote from Jesse, the Reverend Jesse Jackson. If your mind can conceive it and your heart may believe it, I know I can achieve it. And most of you probably know who the great Reverend Jesse Jackson is. Okay, now I'm going to introduce, have our president of the college introduce our keynote speaker. I'd like to bring to the podium, president of Muskegon Community College, Dr. Dale Nesbury. Yeah, yeah, this one is not, this one is not on. We'll try number three. No. Let's see if the light comes on. Oh, this one. Oh, here we go. Okay, we're going to try number three also. Okay, I'm, okay. I'm going to use my outside voice. Is this better? This is working okay? Well, welcome to you all, especially the young people here. You know, you, you have a panel of, uh, with all due respect, a bunch of old guys sitting in front of you. <laughs> no question. Okay, guys, I'll tell you what. But um, a bunch of old guys here attempting to impart knowledge. And, you know, there, there is uh, significant knowledge on this panel. We have people who have traveled the world who are two-star generals. We have people who have published multiple articles, people who have trained people nationwide and worldwide. And we have an Ohio State Buckeye at the end. <laughs> so, you know, that, that's okay, that's okay. Doc, Dr. Selman, you know, he, he, uh, he spent some time earning that, uh, that, uh, that, that Buckeye cr credential, very proud of himself. But, you know, these are all people who have done the things that you all are going to do. You know, I mean, I, you know, personally, um, I'm in Muskegon because I lived, I've lived all over the country, done this, that, and the other, some of it's in here. But um, I wanted to be in a position where I could help you all. You, 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 you. All of you young, you too, young lady. All the, all the young people in this room. Mr. Dockery, great to see you as well uh, after a few years. Another young man who I swear is not over like 15 years old. He's got to be a little bit older. He's, he's, he's probably, he got a degree, gotten this and that and the other. So, you know, it's, it's, it's important for us to be here. 
to, to serve, serve you. Now, you have our speaker's bio in your packet here, but it's, it's important to understand what he's done and how he's done it. If you take a look at his credentials, he's um, Dean of Campus Affairs at Oakland Community College's Southfield Campus. And Mr. Hawkins, I must admit, I have a son who has not one but two degrees from Oakland Community College. Yes, sir. So very proud of that. My daughter attended OCC as well and OU, but thank you very much for providing them with a very proud education. Now, uh, publications, he's founded organizations um, that serve not just people locally, but people nationally. And that's important because, I mean, none of us on this panel we're even thinking about this kind of thing when we're your age. We just want to just make it through the day and be successful. But you're in a position that you can take our spots, and you will take our spots. Every single one of you, every single one of you will take the spots that we hold, hold today. But, but I would very much like for you to, to listen. You know, think through what, what Mr. Hawkins has to say, because it, it's, a, it's a wonderful message, and it's something that it inspired me after having learned um, more about what he is all about. So without further ado, Jawan Hawkins. I want mine too, I want my love. <laughs> We're all in this together. Well thank you Dr. Nesbury for that wonderful introduction. Thank you to the MCC family. I call you family because uh, as a higher education professional, we all share in the challenges but also the successes of the students that we serve. Uh, I most certainly want to give a shout out to my brother from another mother, uh, Mr. German, for giving me the call, uh, making the call to have me come out and speak with you all this morning at the inaugural Men of Color Achievement Conference. Uh, we're going to talk about achievement today, but we're going to talk more in depth about the path that it takes to reach achievement and to make that a tangible goal for everyone in this room assembled. Also want to acknowledge our distinguished panel members. I'm humbled to be amongst you and I look forward to a fruitful discussion this morning. Uh, this is going to be a conversation. How many of you all are students? Okay, so that means that you all sit through several lectures throughout a given week, some for hours at a time, and the last thing we want to do with you today is give you another lecture, right? If I, I could sit up here and lecture, they gave me an extra 15 minutes now. <laughs> I promise you, I will use every minute. My wife tells me that I'm a bad closer because uh, my classes at OCC that I teach as an adjunct always run over the allotted time. So you don't want to play that game with me today. All right. But how are we feeling? How are we truly feeling about being at the first Men of Color Achievement Conference? I was actually uh, pleasantly surprised to see some ladies in the audience, uh, probably just as many ladies as we have young men, but being married, I know the value of having uh, strong women in your life, uh, be it in a, a collegial environment, uh, work environment, or a home environment. And so I appreciate you all for being here and supporting the brothers in this room because we're gonna talk a little bit about that dynamic between man, man and woman that we need to cultivate in our communities. And so I thank you for being here. Let's give it up for the ladies. So first up, I want to um, dispel a rumor that's been going around, uh, not just at MCC, but in general. And that rumor has something to do with this word that's on your screen, and that's the agenda. Um, oftentimes, this word takes on a very negative connotation. Uh, having an agenda in some walks of life uh, is, is seen as having some type of undermined plan, or you're trying to backdoor a particular uh, initiative and infuse your agenda within it. Uh, women say that men have an agenda, and sometimes we do. Uh, men say that women have an agenda. Republicans say that Democrats have an agenda, right? And so on and so forth. But I would uh, venture to say that if we don't have an agenda, or as Mr. Saunders so eloquently said, an assignment, 
then we could miss the mark in terms of what we could potentially uh, accomplish, not just today, but as a result of the work that comes out of this discussion, right? Um, my pastor, Dr. James L. Mormon, said it quite plainly this past weekend when I was sitting in service. This service, I did not fall asleep. <laughs> he said, a plan without action is a dream. However, action without a plan is a nightmare. And so we have to focus both on the plan and the action today. So I encourage you all to come to this discussion with an agenda, make your agenda plain, and let's talk about how we can make that agenda uh, action oriented, how we can edify our community as a result of the agenda that you brought forth today. So whether your agenda is uh, making sure that our politicians are representative of the initiatives that we want to see take place in our community, or you're an economist and you want to make sure that we're supporting black businesses, uh, perhaps you want to ensure that our police force is representative of the communities that they serve. Uh, I'm an educator, so it's important for me to know that our educational systems are functioning and that they're serving the young people that we see in this room. That when they transition to an institution like MCC, OCC, uh, any other institution, that they are prepared to excel in that environment. Uh, I'm sure there's some brothers here today and some women as well that are interested in wanting to resolve this issue that we have going on with mass incarceration of our black men. How many of you all saw 13th? Very disturbing documentary about a systemic and historical uh, uh, pattern of mass incarceration that stemmed from slavery. This is modern day slavery that we're dealing with right now. So we have some important agenda items that need to be addressed today. I'm gonna to address them from a, an, an, an educational lens because that's my, that's my lane. And I believe in staying within my lane, right? You don't want me giving you re relationship advice. I've been married 10 years, but you, you still don't want me giving you relationship advice. Trust me, just trust me on that one. But I can give information and impart knowledge relative to overcoming obstacles and ultimately becoming successful in this environment. And so for me, my agenda is about student success. It's about the young men and the young women that are sitting in this room that are pursuing a college degree or a college certificate uh, with the mindset that it's going to make them a better person. It's going to help them build family. It's going to help them build their community. And if you jump off of the train too early, if you don't finish, and I was speaking to our Dean of Campus Affairs here just before this event about not finishing what you start, then the ramifications are dire. And so it's incumbent upon me not only to have this discussion in this environment, but to spread the good news of student success throughout our country, because our country depends on it. The future of our country depends on it. You've heard the moniker over the course of the last you know, 12, 13 months, make America great again. You all are going to make America great. It's not gonna be some, someone who has a title. It's not gonna be someone that we uh, perceive to be a leader. You all are the leaders that you wanna see. We really are. So the reason why I'm so passionate about student success is because when I was sitting in your seats, I was not quite sure why I was sitting in that seat for one and had no idea how I was going to make it from admission to graduation. I was a first generation college student, born to a single mother, one of three boys, I was the middle, and I uh, know I do not have the middle child syndrome, so don't try to diagnose me here, okay? Uh, but I grew up on the west side of Detroit. And in my neighborhood, we didn't have conversations about going to college. We didn't have conversations about going off to the service. We didn't have conversations about community activism. Uh, many of my friends were either dealing drugs, doing drugs, uh, or both. And trending toward a life of peril as it pertains to their futures. And so for me, the blueprint was not necessarily there for educational achievement. Uh, my dad had a sixth grade education. My mother had an 11th grade education. So neither one of them even had a high school diploma, let alone a college degree. And so they couldn't impart 
the knowledge upon me that I needed in order to be successful at the next level. But they understood that education was important. And I want to make sure that I make something clear. My mother and father were not together as a married couple, but I appreciate having access to my father. Um, how many fathers do we have in the room? Let's give these, these, these gentlemen a round of applause. We underestimate the role that fathers play, uh, not only in their daughters' lives, there's a special bond between men and their daughters, but our young men, they need men in their lives. They need men in their lives to show them, to give them the blueprint for what it means to be a man, okay? And so at one point in time, when I was a child, uh, on my block, my father actually purchased a house that was not directly across the, the street from us, but right next to that house. So I could literally look out of my bedroom window and see my father's house. He wanted to be a part of our lives. And so with that being said, they made an investment in our education as young men, as young students. They made sure that we went to the best schools that they could afford on a shoestring budget. And my mother put me on two buses to go to the east side of Detroit to go to Martin Luther King High School, which at that time was one of the better schools in the city. And so she understood that I had to be in an environment where college success was a daily discussion. Uh, we had students that were studying abroad, that were learning different languages, that were participating in academic games. We had honor societies and so on and so forth. That wasn't the case in my neighborhood school. And so they made a huge investment to ensure that student success was something that was ever present in the minds of their children. But with that being said, I still was a horrible college student. So I stayed local and went to Wayne State University. I'm a mama's boy, so I had to stay close to mama, right? Okay, I mean, I admit it. But I stayed close to home, went to Wayne State University, and ultimately ended up with a 1.7 after my freshman year. Why? Because I wasn't making intentional steps toward ingratiating myself or integrating myself into that environment. Okay, what are those intentional steps? Our academic advisors in the room know those intentional steps, right? It's going to see your advisor, it's going to tutoring, right? It's participating in your study groups, it's going to visit your instructors during office hours. We have any instructors in the room? Probably the most lonesome part of your day is during your office hours. If you have folks coming to you during office hours, those are the students that understand that you're the, you're the plug, right? That's the plug. If I want to know what the rubric is to get an A on a paper, who better to tap into for Intel than the person who's going to be grading that paper, right? It's simple, but I didn't understand that concept. I didn't understand that concept. And so ultimately, I got a very eloquently written letter from the registrar's office <laughs> at Wayne State University. Yep. And it said, uh, Juwan Hawkins, we thank you for contributing I'm paraphrasing. Uh, one year and a half of tuition to our fine institution. However, if you don't pull your GPA up above a 2.0, uh, we're going to have to say goodbye to you, at least for a year, OK? And my best friend who attended Northern High School, he and I are still friends to this day. He's the godfather of my kid, uh, best man in wedding and all that good stuff, fraternity brother. Uh, we both got that same letter. So, you know, sometimes you're sitting at home and maybe you try out for a team or uh, you apply to a school and you're like, did you get your letter? Did you get your letter? Well, we didn't have that conversation. <laughs> <laughs> but we both got the letter. <laughs> and so uh, it was because of a, of a brother by the name of Donnie Elston. And he was my work study supervisor. Anyone here on work study? Any college students on work study? Awesome program. It's financial aid that you don't have to pay back, so that's just a tidbit of an opportunity you want to take advantage of. But he was my work study advisor and a mentor to me. And he said, Juwan, uh, if you're serious about wanting to stay at Wayne State University, I know someone who was on the appeals committee, and I will talk to them on your behalf. And he thought that much of me as a student, as a young man, to try and retain me as a student at Wayne State. And I said, sure, you know, please, whatever you can do, work it out. And so uh, he, he did, and I was able to stay at Wayne State. But that was the aha moment 
for me. It was getting that letter and reading plainly in black and white that I had failed. Mind you, when I came out of King High School, I was a 3.75 student. I was part of the National Honor Society. Uh, I was doing well academically. I had a full ride scholarship to Wayne State. Academic scholarship. I had two. Compact scholarship and I had the Michigan Competitive Scholarship. Lost them both in a matter of three semesters. Dig that, right? Could you imagine going home and having that conversation with my parents? I tried not to. I'm so glad they didn't mail report cards home at that time. So at this point, I want to engage, I think I went a little fast there. I want to engage the audience, uh, in particular our students. Can you tell me one thing, if we want Family Feud right now, and Steve Harvey is standing up here, we got a couple brothers that look a little close. <laughs> <laughs> I love y'all, man, I love y'all. But uh, we're trying to lighten up the mood here a little bit now. We'll take the edge off a little bit. but. Uh, name something that every successful college student must have. What would be the top answer on the board? Yes, sir. <laughs> Study habits. The mindset to be successful. I love that right there. You have something over there? Is that Cameron? She said she stole your thunder. All right. Time, oh my gosh, time management. I need that as an adult. Can you help me out with that? <laughs> you know, as, as you matriculate through higher education and into uh, what they call the real world, this is a simulation of the real world, uh, that plate just keeps getting more full. So time management is always a work in progress. But thank you for sharing that. One more. Good work ethic. Good work ethic. I love it. I love it. Those are all excellent answers. They would probably be two, three, and four on the board. But number one would be this. Has to be, you have to have a why. What is your reason for pursuing your college degree? What is your reason for getting up early for eight o'clock class? What is your reason for foregoing a social function to sit in the library and study. What is your reason for calling one of your group members that's been avoiding you for two weeks because they didn't do their part of the group project? It's your why. Only 43% of students who begin a college degree program will ultimately complete that program. And the reason why I drove three hours to be here is because for our young men, that number is even more abysmal. I graduated from Wayne State University where currently only one in 10 students of color will complete a degree program within four to six years. I was on the outside of that statistic. It took me eight years to graduate from Wayne State University. So you have a failure standing in front of you by educational standards, right? But we're going to talk a little bit about what failure and success is, because remember, I got an extra 15 minutes here, right? But no, you need a why. And my why was there was no way on God's green earth that I was going to go home and tell my parents who sent me to private school, who sent me over to King High School, who put me in DAPSEP programs and compact programs, there was no way I was going to go home and tell them that I was dropping out of college. You know, let me make my bed in the basement. I'll be chilling here for a little while while I'm looking for a job. That was not going to happen. And so I implore you, everyone in this room, whether it's something that you aspire to do tomorrow or something that you aspire to do in the next five to 10 years, discover why it is you want to do that thing. Why do you want to pursue a degree in engineering? Why do you want to pursue a degree in nursing, pharmacology? political science. Why do you want to do these things? I challenge you to come up with your why because that why is the thing that's going to prevent you from quitting. Mr. Saunders talked about, we don't have any quitters in this room, right? 
Do we have any quitters in this room? No quitters. All right, so if we don't have any quitters in this room, then that means that everyone here has to have something that in that dark moment, when you get your letter, <coughs> figuratively I'm speaking, right? When you get your letter, when you have a 10 page paper due on Thursday and it's Wednesday night, and you haven't started your outline yet, <coughs> what's gonna push you through to finish that paper? It's your why. When you haven't read the three chapters that you're gonna be tested on on Monday, and the Lions are playing on Sunday, and you're on, <laughs> you're on the first chapter, what's gonna make you turn that game off? It's your why. This is the most powerful thing you have. It's the most powerful tool you have because there is no force working against you on this planet that is stronger than your why. We're transitioning into the who of success. We talked about the what. The what is your why. But your squad, your team of people, your family, your friends, your mentors, your mentees are part of the team that's going to get you across the finish line. I tell students all the time, student success is a team sport. It's not an individual exercise. I spent the better part of that year and a half that I was on active probation <coughs> trying to figure out college by myself. I spent the better part of that time spinning my wheels trying to figure out what that environment provided for me as a resource, but ultimately beat my, beat my head up against the wall trying to figure it out by myself. I implore you to evaluate your team or your squad. I, I purposely put the Cavaliers up here because it baffles me that people chastise LeBron James for wanting to have better teammates. Now we, we can agree that he's probably one of the top three players in the, in the world, right? If you don't believe he's the best, that's, that's fine. I'm not even a LeBron James fan, so I'm not gonna fight you on that, right? But he's, he's one of the top players in the world, and yet he still goes out every summer and says, you know what, general manager, I need you to send me better role players. I need a better team around me. So if the best player in the world, arguably, sees value in having a strong team, why don't we? Why would we fault him for that? You all have friends, right? Do you have friends? Okay, all right, at least one. I encourage you, and this might be a little uncomfortable, every year you need to reevaluate your circle of friends. Mm -hmm. Every year, reevaluate the people that you are spending the most time with because they will ultimately determine how successful you're going to be. People are, who are successful hang out with people who are successful. On the opposite side of that spectrum, you already know what I'm gonna say, right? So you have to de decide what influences, what within you, who, who, are you, who you're going to allow within your circle of influence, and what impact do they make on you and your success. Do you, does anyone in here allow people to mess with their money? No? <laughs> now my wife handles the finances in the household, but she's not, she's not messing with the money. See, I, I understood we won one accord when he raised that hand, I already know. But everybody's got to play their role, right? So you don't have your center in basketball, well now you do, shooting three-pointers, right? Back in the day you didn't have them shooting three-pointers. Kareem wasn't shooting three-pointers, right? Because it's got hooked from the three-point line. But, just like uh, the last five minutes of the game, or the last two minutes of the game, you're not gonna put the ball in the hands of a role player. You're gonna put it in your superstar's hands, right? Now here's the thing about letting people mess with your money. Anytime that you allow someone in your circle to veer you off the path to getting your degree, you are effectively allowing that person to mess with your money. Point blank, period. So when you go to that party that someone encouraged you to go to, instead of completing that paper, when you play 2K or you play you know, a Madden, 
instead of studying for your assignment because your friend wanted to play online with you, then you allowed that person to mess with your money. Because there's a direct correlation between college de degree completion and your earning potential. Think about that. The average college graduate is going to make over a million dollars more than an individual coming out of school with just a high school diploma in their career. So when you allow that person to view you <coughs> off that path, they're playing with your money. So I'm going to ask you again, how many people in here let people mess with their money? I allowed it to happen. I allowed it to happen. I chased the girls. I shot pool. You know, I went to the parties. I played spades in the, in the student center as opposed to going to class and see where it landed me, academic probation. So that means every class that I failed that semester, those semesters that I was on academic probation, guess what I had to do? Repeat those classes. Think they, do you think they let me repeat them for free? <coughs> think about that. Think about that. So I paid for some classes two and three times over because I allowed someone to mess with my money. So I had to get to a point where I reevaluated my circle. And I said, you know, I can't hang out with my man over here anymore because he's still playing, playing spades. I went to class, he was playing spades. Oh, I'll jump the gun again. I came back to class, he's still playing spades. You, you've seen it before. Where my college students at? You've seen it before. My counselors, you probably had to yank some people out of the student center goofing around. And there's nothing wrong with having fun. I pledged a fraternity. We threw the parties, we had the step shows, we did, we did the whole nine. But we had to balance that out with being effective college students. Okay, so I'm not saying you can't have fun, but your squad's gotta be tight. They have to know how to manage their time, like the young lady said. They have to know how to study. They have to know how to be supportive of you and your, and your goals. Otherwise, you gotta make some trades, right? You may have to pick up some free agents that you haven't spoken to before. Because it's go time, it's winning time. Now once you have mastered the art of being a successful college student, how many students in college do I have that have matriculated beyond their freshman year? So any sophomores and up. Okay, so we have one. Now, everyone in the room should be looking at that young lady. And I met her late, earlier, her name is Kenyatta, right? Kenyatta is a resource because she has completed something that most of the young people in the room have not, right? You, were you perfect in completing your freshman and sophomore year? No. But guess where you're gonna be next, next week? Can you tell them where you're gonna be next week? At commencement. Let's give it up for Kenyatta. Kenyatta is a resource. So Kenyatta's responsibility is to now impart the knowledge that she has upon all the, other, all the individuals in the room that didn't raise their hand, right? Put, I'll put something on you. Not all of them, but a few. Because we're spreading the good news of college success. One person, one student at a time, okay? But some of you are freshmen right now. Some of you are seniors in high school. You should be having intentional conversations about those that are coming behind you about what it took for you to get to where you are currently, right? Okay, so how many seniors do we have in high school? All right, my seniors, you're a resource to the juniors and the sophomores and the freshmen, whether you're related to them or not. They are, you all are interconnected because you have a common responsibility to your community. The example that I always give is someone knowing how to change a tire. It's kind of a lost art to a, to a certain extent. Is there anyone in the room that knows how to change a tire? With an actual tire iron? No. Okay, so you've got a lot, of, a lot of resources in the room. So when you look in your college classrooms and your high school classrooms, you should be looking for resources. If you did not raise your hand, then that means that you could be susceptible to at least a $75 hookup to a tow truck, right? And that's before we even start talking about mileage, right? Back to where you live. And then you have to pay to actually have the tire put on. So 
knowing people who are in key positions to assist you can save you time and money. Two of the most precious commodities we have, right? I said that I tried to do things on my own and it cost me a lot of money because I had to repeat all of those classes. You need to meet somebody who knows how to change a tire. You need to meet somebody who's going to be graduating next week. You need to meet somebody who can give you some information that you don't currently possess. That is a resource. A resource doesn't necessarily mean that it's one of us. A resource can be sitting right next to you because everyone in this room possesses a quality, a piece of intel, a skill set. You've had an experience that the person sitting next to you doesn't have. You are a resource. Be a resource to the people around you. I want to share this quote with you uh, because it resonated with me. I was scrolling through Instagram, and yeah, I know I'm an old man, but I am on Instagram. Uh, and it's a quote by author and speaker Darren Hardy that says, winning is not determined by how fast you start. Winning is determined by how long you last. Do we have any folk in the room that can outlast some things? See, one head nod. You're gonna have to, you're gonna have to outlast some things in this life. You're gonna have to outlast fear, doubt, you're going to have to outlast some instructors that don't like you. You're going to have to outlast some classes that you don't necessarily, that aren't necessarily your strong point. You're going to have to outlast deaths in the family along the time that you're pursuing your college degree. You're going to have to outlast sickness. You're going to have to outlast not understanding certain material. Because this is not a sprint, this is a marathon. I had some very candid conversations with some audience members before we started, and we have similar stories. We didn't have a smooth path to graduation. For some of us, it took multiple years to graduate. But guess what? We finished. We finished what we started because we outlasted all of those obstacles that were working against us. So how many people in the room do I have who can outlast all of those things we just talked about? If you're ready, to overcome any obstacle that's in front of you, I want you to give yourself a round of applause in advance. So I think it's well established that you're going to take some body blows. You may take a couple jabs to the face along this journey to your success. But you've got to learn and you've got to build up a tolerance for picking yourself up off that mat and ultimately marching, as Mr. Saunders said, toward where you want to go in life. One of the biggest problems that we have as a society, in particular our young folks, is not wanting to take an L. Right? Y'all all been clowning Meek Mill for like two years because he took an L when he tried to battle Drake, right? Does that make sense to everybody in the room? Y'all know about Meek Mill? <laughs> where am I? Who am I talking to? <laughs> We don't want to take a loss. We don't want to be embarrassed. We don't want people to look at us as a failure. We want everything to be smooth. We want to win all the time. Right? Winning is the ultimate goal, but along that path, you're going to have to take some losses. I would subscribe to the notion that you have to take two losses, or two L's. Take the L as the loss, and you take the L as the lesson. There's always a lesson to be learned when you take a loss. If you're not taking an L, then guess what? You're not even in the game. There's only one surefire way never to lose a game, and that's to never get into it. Stay on the sidelines. Observe. Oh, man, look at him over there. He's getting crossed over. Oh, man, my man got dunked on. That's cool, but they're in the game. So they have an opportunity to go down to the other end and score, make a pass, and contribute to their team winning. We can't afford to sit on the sidelines and allow other people to take those L's for us. And I'm talking about the lessons. Because life in and of itself is a lesson. And if you're not prepared to learn from those lessons, then guess what? You're going to start continuously taking those other L's. Right? And that's a slippery slope. And so what did Big Sean say? I'm going to try this one more time now. Don't mess with me. <laughs> 
I need y'all to complete this sentence. Last night I took an L. One more time. Y'all messing with me, man. I, I thought I was in the wrong place. I thought I was in the Twilight Zone. Last night I took an L. But tonight I bounced back. Those words are true. We need some people in this room to bounce back. We need some people in this room not to be deterred by taking one loss. Oh man, I'm taking my ball and go home. No, we don't have time for that. You gotta pick up the ball, the baton, and you gotta run with it toward the finish line. Yeah, you gotta jump over some hurdles, some pit, some potholes, we're in Michigan, okay? It's not gonna be a smooth road, but the, the gift at the end is the fruit of the labor and the gratification of knowing that you got knocked down and got back up. So with that being said, for the sake of the next generation that's coming behind you, I need you to be great. And there's some very specific things I need people in this room to do in order to be great. I need you to find your why and allow yourself to be great. I need you to put down the joysticks and allow yourself to be great. Pick up a book and let you be great. Men, seek a woman of substance and let you be great. Women, seek a man of integrity and let you be great. Cast away your doubts and your fears and let you be great. And most importantly, you need to believe in yourself and let you be great. That's my time, I thank you for yours. Let's give Mr. Hawkins another hand. Thank you very much, Mr. Hawkins, for that great speech and the knowledge that you've given these young people. And um, we're going to open it up to some questions. Um, if you have any questions, um, just kind of raise your hands. I don't see my power of unity staff. Oh, okay, here's one right here. So if you have any questions, raise your hands. If you'd like to ask Mr. Hawkins any questions or anything about um, his journey, as a keynote speaker, as a educator. No questions? Wow. That was a lot of knowledge. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. Mm -hmm. Okay, what I'm going to do now. Oh, oh, we, oh we have one. Okay. Um, okay. Well, first, my name is Felicia Harmon, and I'm with Michigan State University. Okay. I just wanted to know what is your why? What was your why that kept you going through those types of things? Like, um, what was your why that kept you going throughout all that you went through and the challenges that you faced? What continued to make you motivated to achieve what you have, what you have achieved thus far? Uh, thank you for that question. Uh, ultimately, my why was, was, was my parents and the contribution that they made uh, in not wanting to face them after they had made all those contributions and saying, you know what, I thank you for making those contributions. However, I'm going to fall short of the goal that you set out for me, which was to become college educated and ultimately move to a career that was viable and contributing to society. And so I, I, there was no way that I was going to have that conversation with them after they had shared so much with me and sacrificed so much for me. Thank you for asking. Other questions? Like your okay, um, so your who? Who was your who? I know you said you, you were in a fraternity, but outside of that fraternity and your um, your god, uh, the son, the godfather of your child, who else was your who? In terms of my squad, it was, uh, Jimmy just mentioned, it was uh, Donnie, Donnie Elston, who was my mentor, who was a career and my first study supervisor. He was actually the person who inspired me to want to be a capital. He actually crossed at Michigan State. And uh, when, I, when I had finally gotten my grades up to par and I was eligible to join a fraternity, he came to me and said, you know, Jawan, uh, when or if the chapter were to come back, because currently they weren't, uh, at that point they weren't on the yard, uh, he said, I want you to be the president. And then he said, my best friend, he said, you're going to be the vice president. And 
So he put a little bit of pressure on us, but uh, we ultimately had to step up to the plate and make that happen. And that actually did come to fruition. I ended up being the president of the chapter at Wayne State University for three years. And um, one of the things that came out of that was that um, I no longer just represented myself when I joined a fraternal organization. And you would think about the parties, we think about the step shows, we think about the letters, but ultimately it's the contribution that you made to your campus and the campus and the uh, community surrounding it that determines your success within those organizations. And so uh, I wanted to be successful academically because I didn't want to embarrass the noobs. <laughs> I just, I, 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 did, I couldn't have people going around talking bad about it. It's like, man, it took them 12 years to graduate. You know, those noobs don't, don't do anything. No, I wanted people to speak highly upon us. And so I had to get my act together, not just for myself, but I didn't want to embarrass the fraternity. I have a question for you. So you mentioned that in life we all have to take L's, whether that's a loss or a lesson. A lot of times I notice that students don't want to ask for help. They would rather just figure it out on their own and all the time that's not right. So as being in admissions, we tell those students all the time, we're here to help you. Don't struggle through. Let us be able to assist you so that we can help you know get you to the next level wherever you need to be so what would be your advice I guess for those students who really don't like to ask for help and just kind of want to figure it out on their own I think at the root of that question the word that kept resonating in my head was humility and um, I went into the higher education environment with a lot of pride because of my educational you know uh, acumen up to that point in high school but I had to realize very quickly that college can humble you um, it will essentially expose all of your flaws academically I placed into uh, pre after taking pre-calculus in high school Can you imagine how much of a blow to my ego that was right and so I started out in developmental ed classes that weren't going to count for college credit. And so being smacked down that quickly and that swiftly humbled me very quickly. And I said, you know what, there's no way that I'm going to complete this degree program myself. I have to tap into the resources around me. Otherwise, I'm going to, I'm going to sink. I'm going to drown. This isn't going to happen. And so humility is, is really at the core of that. Once you humble yourself to the point where you can actually walk up to somebody and say, you know what, I don't know how to get to uh, Rochester College. Can you give me some directions? Right? We don't like asking for directions, especially men. You know, but it's the same, it's the same concept. You're asking for direction. Uh, and it doesn't mean that you're stupid. I didn't, I didn't get a 1.7 in college because I was stupid. I got a 1.7 because I was ignorant. And there's a difference. So it's a very significant difference. And I was ignorant to the culture of being a successful college student. And part of that culture is tapping into your academic advisors, your uh, admissions officers, your tutors, your academic support centers, and so on and so forth. All the resources are there. There's some very well-intentioned people working at all of our higher ed institutions that want to see you succeed. It actually helps the bottom line of a higher ed institution for students to graduate, right? It's not one force working against the other. but. You have to make us, as higher educators, earn our money, right? You don't want to, whatever our salary is, we should not be sitting in our offices twiddling our thumbs because students are not tapping into those resources. You all should be coming to us because we work for you, right? And so ultimately, yes, I would say humility, that's just a humility to, to, to put out your hand and say, hey, I may not even know what question to ask, but I just need help. I have I have a question. Uh, I wanted to know what did you go to college for? What did you go to college to like set for it to be? Great question. Uh, because initially, because I didn't have a why, I started out pre-medicine because my mom wanted a doctor in the family. <laughs> Sound like a good idea, right? And so my freshman year or my first semester, I took bio. I took English. I took math and I took humanities. And I was so frustrated. I was putting so much effort into the biology class because that was a subject that I struggled in that by the time I got to humanities and they would show these slideshows um, and they, they turned the lights off. Uh, and I sat in the front because I wanted to be a very attentive student. But um, I would fall asleep. 
And so I was really spinning my wheels about what I wanted to do because I was actually living someone else's why. I was living my mother's why. She wanted a doctor in the family. I didn't want to be a doctor. I had not evaluated myself to determine what it is I wanted to do and who I was. And so I had to sit down and uh, I was talking to some of the students about the interest inventories and I, I did the Discover program and career cruising and it spit out some careers that might be of interest to me. And it wasn't until then that I decided that I wanted to work with people, I wanted to work with students specifically. And uh, working with that recruiter, um, Donnie Elston, actually helped me determine that this is the environment that I ultimately want to work in. And so uh, at that point in time, being a recruiter for a four-year university was like, that was the holy grail for me. You know, I'm like, hey, I can do that. You know, I'm, I make about 50K and that, I'll, I'll be living large. And of course, life, you know, taught me something different. But ultimately, uh, that's how I knew to work in higher education was working with Mr. Elston. So I encourage everybody to do work study because it does teach you a lot about yourself, teach you a lot about your skill set, um, perhaps so your people skills, interpersonal skills, and so if it wasn't for that opportunity, there's no way I'm standing here today. Um, could you share maybe what was some of the obstacles or distractions that actually, you know, made it take so long for you to finish, like specifics? Girls. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just saying, you know, it is what it is. I'm just being candid with you. You know, I, I, I had, uh, I had an issue. I had to go into therapy. No, I'm just joking. But, <laughs> but no, I, you know, I, I was not, I was not focused. I think a lack of focus would probably be the best way to conceptualize it. The girls were like a function of that. Um, the hanging out in the rec. Uh, was a function of that, a manifestation of that lack of focus, but ultimately that's what it was. And when you don't know what your why is, it's easy to get derailed because someone else can just insert their why into your why, right? Into that gap. And then you end up doing things that other people want you to do as opposed to what you need to be doing. And so I think it was a lack of focus. That was the, that's, that's really the, at the core, the nucleus of all of my shortfalls as a student. Right here. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> okay, no, you, nice jacket and everything. I yeah. missed you. Right. <laughs> you say that your family uh, sent you to a special school, an advanced school, from the beginning. Okay, what advice do you have for children that don't have this option, where they come from that the counselors don't even counsel them mm -hmm. about higher education? Well, it, it's interesting that you say that because about six years into being at that special school, my parents ran out of money. And so I ended up going to Detroit Public Schools. And the issues of Detroit Public Schools are well documented. Uh, actually, King High School, where I graduated from, is Detroit Public Schools. But of course, they treat certain schools different than they do other schools. And so if you're not in an environment where there's a college-going culture, then as a, as a parent, it's incumbent upon you to create early exposure opportunities. We have, uh, and I co-facilitate a program called Man Up at Open Community College for students in Southfield. Southfield, Michigan is just north of Detroit for those who are familiar. And there isn't necessarily a strong college going culture within that community. And so we created that program because we saw young men like me coming to OCC who were ill prepared to really adjust to the environment. And so we felt like either A, as deans, we can take a more punitive approach, and when they come to us and they act a fool, we can kick them out, right? Because we have power to do that. Or we can take a more nurturing approach and create a mechanism through which they can be coached up so that they know what's expected of them when they get there. And so we decided to do the latter. And so we work with students 10 through 12th grade. They take our academic success skills course on a Saturday throughout the winter, even when it's 12, you know, 12 inches of snow, and they're dedicated. So they do have to meet us halfway, but there are programs like our Man Up program throughout several of our communities. It's incumbent upon the parents, the guardians, to look for those opportunities and create a mechanism through which their children can participate. Our program for the first, we're, we, we just had our graduation last week for the seventh cohort. For the first five years, it was absolutely free. Currently, they pay $50. That includes their tuition for two, two credit college course, their books, the instructors, 
guest presenters. We feed them every week. Uh, their awards at the end of the semester and everything. And so we're willing to make that investment like many of our panelists and, and community stakeholders, but it's incumbent upon us, the family members, to, if we see something in the paper, we see something online, we have to share that link with, uh, with those parents just like we would share pictures from our vacation. It's just that important. I hope I answered your question. Thank you. My man Cameron has another question. What was, um, what was your main reason, what was the main reason that you wanted to become an educator? Frustration. Uh, I would say that my frustration motivated me to ensure that as many students as possible that I could encounter didn't experience that same frustration. Uh, are they going to bump their heads? Absolutely. Are, are there going to be some students in this room that perhaps, you know, I won't say fail a class, maybe you get a D in a class, maybe you get a C minus in a class. Yeah, that's going to happen. But if I can make the road a little bit straighter, a little bit smoother for the next person, the next generation, then I have essentially righted some of my wrongs as a student and undergraduate. And so it, my, my motivation is really the people in this room. Like I said, I, I, I didn't just come over here to play games. I came over here because this is the future. And we say that uh, flippantly sometimes. Oh, the children are the future. Children are the future. No, you are seriously the future. You know, some of us are going to be transitioning into retirement. Uh, many of us may go off and pursue other ventures. Uh, and it's incumbent upon you all to take that mantle and be the next educator, the next uh, public servant, the next police chief, the next fire chief, the next president of a university or college. And so if we don't give you the building blocks in order to reach that goal, if we don't reach down and up, then we're not doing our job. Point blank period, we're not doing our job. And so let's give our panelists another round of applause for being here <laughs> and making an investment in you. So, and I appreciate that because right now, just going back to that analogy, making us earn our money, when you ask questions, you're making us relevant. When you ask questions, you're making us think about how we can help you. When you're asking questions, you're inspiring us to want to go an extra mile for you because we, we're going to meet you where you, where you, where you are. But I, we need to see that you're willing to make equal and opposite investment in yourself. Are we willing to do that? Are we willing to do that? Yes, sir. Maybe. This has got to be a definite. There's somebody that is yet to grace this earth that is waiting on you, that is relying on you to be your best you. I have a four-year-old son, and I'm starting to think about what position he would be in right now, even as a four-year-old, if I didn't reach my goals? Would he even be here right now? My wife probably wouldn't even look at me <laughs> if I was walking out of here as a college dropout, right? She has a master's degree. And let me say this, too, to the young men. Our sisters, sisters that are sitting right next to you right now, are doing their thing. They are doing their thing. The highest population of college graduates, we're talking master's degrees and PhDs, is represented by African American women. Mm -hmm. So my concern, and once again, my motivation, to ensure that they have men in their communities that they can build a family with, that they can talk to about investing, they can talk to about child rearing. They can talk to about traveling the world. If we're dropping out in high school, if we're dropping out the first time we take an L, we're dropping out after freshman year in college, who are they going to build with? Who, who are going to be our community leaders? If you don't have strong men, you don't have a strong community. I'll repeat that again. If you don't have strong men, you don't have a, a strong community. You simply don't. And so you all need to meet the young men in this room, where they are, they're out of their business. The young men I talked about that were failing out of OCC, they were harassing young women in the hallways. Those young women were going to class. Yeah, 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 I know I'm cute, yeah, yeah, but I'm going to school. You're not going to stop me from going to the library. 
I might even give you the number, but guess what? I'm still going to, I'm going to handle my business. And those brothers will still be in the hallway. Don't get left in the hallway. Because eventually, financial aid runs out, or if your parents are paying for it, their money runs out. And guess what? We got these ladies out here. Where y'all at? Highly educated, degree, professional women. I hear brothers, I'm in my 30s. I hear brothers in my 30s, oh, there's no good women out here. Man, there's some phenomenal ladies out here handling their business. But where are the dudes? Where are the guys? We got to meet them where they are. So that's, why, that's, that's, that's another reason why I'm here. Okay? Any other questions? All right. Man, one, one, one more. Yeah. <clears throat> this will be the last question, and then we're going to um, come over to the panel, and they're going to speak about five minutes before we have lunch, and then we'll have lunch and come back for the panel discussion. Um, when you said you lost the two scholarships and you were scared to go home, what was your mom's reaction? <laughs> Honestly, I don't think she ever found out that I lost those scholarships. <laughs> 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 I moved out shortly thereafter, so uh, couldn't leave a paper trail, couldn't leave a paper trail. So, you know, uh, but you talk about bouncing back. It took me about a year and a half repeating all of those classes, trying to get my GPA back up, talking to my academic advisor about my new plan because I was going to go into sociology at that point in time, which I ultimately graduated with that degree. Um, I got those scholarships back. Thankfully, those scholarships were waiting for me as long as I met the, 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 the requirements. And so I had used a year. I still had three years of eligibility for those scholarships. I basically sat out a year and a half because I couldn't use it, but once my GPA got back up to par, I was able to retain those scholarships. But no, she, she still doesn't know that I lost those scholarships. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. I'd just like to give our panel a chance to say something that kind of greets you. Um, we're going to take probably maybe a few minutes for them just to say something. Then when we come back from lunch, we're going to get into a, a deep um, conversation, and they're going to tell you a little bit about their path and their career. So let's start with um, Dr. Uh, Joseph Chief Thomas. Sir. Good morning. Morning. I am so proud to be here because you are here and you are the future. To me, you are the future. I'm not going to be a chief of police all my life. Matter of fact, I don't want to be one now. <laughs> I got this job by accident. I came up here to, to be a keynote speaker and went home with a job. <laughs> my wife said, you did what? I said, I'm the chief in Muskegon Heights now. They need a police chief. But I just want to share a little thing, a few things with you, and I will share a more this afternoon with where I come from. I was born and raised on a cotton plantation. I'm 30 minutes older than most people. I was raised on the Jim Crow. I've had some people do some bad things to me. And I had always said that I wanted to wake up and not hungry and make a change without burning down the building. Going on a riot was not the way to change people's feeling about you. Then I met a man, and I'll tell you about that later on. I met a man called Martin Luther King Jr. You might have heard of him. Some people read about him. I met the man in a place called Clarksdale, Mississippi. And he said two things. No matter who you are, people are going to discriminate against you. That's the way it is. It happens that way. But two things that make people treat you differently, and that's money and education. Remember I told you I was born on a cotton plantation? We didn't have any money. I listened to that man and used him as a resource. Where do you go? Over here. <laughs> Don't do that. Don't stand behind me like that. <laughs> and I used that man as a resource and I chose to educate myself. I got five degrees and didn't pay for any of it. Awesome. Awesome. It was all scholarship. My dad was a bootlegger. I watched my first person get killed when I was 14 years old, one of my dad's blind pig. 
I made a choice. I don't think I want to do what dad's doing. <laughs> now, I love my dad. I'm proud of being a Thomas. But I said, you know what? Running a blind pig, selling booze, and watching people shoot each other is not what I want to do. You know, but a lot of my friends dead, and most of them are dead. So I'm in jail. Charles Porter decided to go crawl through the workers' house and say, I said, hey, man, that girl is 15 years old. Yeah, but she said, I can call her because her mother's gone. He's in prison now. And those are my homeboys. So I'm going to talk about that background, where I come from. And I had a dream. I watched cops do some things. I was on Jackson State campus when they had the riots. Okay? I was there. And a police officer hit me with a nightstick. He had this big dog in his hand. And I told him, one of these days, I'm going to be a police chief, and I won't hire fools like you. And guess what? Now, I crack the whip, they take the trip. <laughs> that's not by accident, that's by design. Then I'm going to tell you how I finished Alcorn State University with a bachelor's degree in mathematics in three and a half years with a 2.9 average. I was not that smart. I am not that intelligent. I was stupid enough to go to college that I went there to go to class. I just thought that's what you did because I wanted to make myself better and I would notice that people that were doing good things was going to class. Not like Marvin Weeks. He didn't make it. Hey man, they wouldn't let me graduate. Marvin, you didn't go to class. <laughs> I was dumb enough to think that when an instructor told me to do my homework that I was supposed to do it. So I did it. Because I wanted to do what? Grow up and not be like my dad. I want to grow up and not be hungry, and I want to become a police officer. You know what people told me when I was growing up? They ain't gonna let you be a police. They ain't gonna do that for you. Really? Took me three years, and we'll talk about that later on. But I did. You know what I'm, you know what I'm gonna do at the end of the month? Go back to school. I'm not quite as fortunate as my son. He knows everything. Ask him, he'll tell you. <laughs> I'm still learning. I'm still learning. He called me last night and said, Dad, I think I'm going back to college. And I said, thank you, son. Now, if you're going back to college, I said, let me know where you want to go. I'll write you a check. So we're going to talk about that a little bit when we come back. How did I get where I am? That's a long, rich story. I'm not that, I didn't get where I am because I'm that smart. I got where I am because I listened and came to conferences like this. Oh, by the way, uh, guys, when you doing lunch, you want to come talk to me? Let me tell you about these folks here that you call females. They don't stop marrying you now. They will rather be by themselves than to hang out with somebody that's not at this conference. They will not marry you. Not only that, next time, bring your little white buddy with you because he got the same problem. Got the same problem. We are losing this country to other males. Some of the most powerful males, mentally, financially, and technologically sound, is from China and Japan. You're sitting there with that small smartphone, and you can't even make one. Somebody in this room needs to make a smartphone. We're losing, we're using other people's technology, playing those video games, driving us nuts. We're going to talk about that when we come back. We're going to, I'm going to give you the Joe Thomas story. And you know why I come to conferences like this? I met another lady called Rosa Parks. And she said, you need to put something back, boy. Yeah, that's what they call you, boy. Okay. I got used to it real quick. And you know what? Sometimes you don't know, you don't know who you're going to meet. Watch this. I'm K.A. Sci-Fi New Pie, Fall 69, Gamma Pie, Tail Dog. <laughs> I just let him talk. You know? <laughs> he was having a good time. I said, go ahead, Fred. <laughs> go get him new. But we're going to talk about that when we get back, about how we got where we, am, uh, where we are, and who's going to be the chief of police when I die. Oh, I didn't tell you I was going to die. I'm going to be gone someday. What are you going to do? What are you going to do? Martin Luther King didn't live forever. Put something back. But you got 
to get someplace first in order to do that. Get your own. Stop asking people for a piece of the rock. They don't own the rock anymore. Get your own. We're going to talk about that. I'm going to give this mic to somebody else, and I'm going to sit down <laughs> and leave you alone. And the right new. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Okay, next uh, we'll have our president, Dr. Dale Nasberry. <laughs> Give him a hand, please. All right, folks. I, I spoke with you earlier. I'm going to translate a couple things. Did anyone hear the term blind pig? Yes, yes. Uh, well, at least one man knows. Heard it. Who knows what a blind pig is? Brother, what is it? Oh, oh I, I've heard about that. Oh, oh, okay. <laughs> Well, well let, let, me, let me translate what a blind pig is. <laughs> no, my, my father in 1951 bought um, a blind pig, Dr. Thomas, in 1951 between Twin Lake and Holton, Michigan. That is an illegal bar where they sell bootleg liquor. So, Dr. Thomas, I am impressed. <laughs> I am impressed. <laughs> uh, a couple other things. Uh, yeah, res res respect, your, respect your parents, respect your mother. I'll just give you just a couple bits of information about my mother and my father. I always say that there, there's only one person in this entire world who I'm afraid of, and that is my mother. So, yeah, sir. So, so yeah, she's, talking, she's passed away 40 years ago. So, yeah, I, I listened to what she had to say. And I keep two pennies on my desk. If you walk into my office, you'll see there's like two pennies sitting there. What is that? So. My, my father used to say that people, that avoid people who think they are two cents lit. That's what he'd call them. They thought they were a little bit smarter than you. They weren't, but they were just trying to run a game on you. He says, avoid those people like the plague. So, I mean, you'll, you'll hear a lot of us talk about how we got to where we are today. And, you know, there's, there, we, we'll all talk about our personal stories, not so much what happened professionally, because that, I mean, that takes care of itself. But boy, yeah, just, just, Stay, stay with the right people. Keep the people in your sphere of influence who are good, close, and those who aren't far away. I want to thank uh, Mr. Hawkins very much for making that point. That is just so important to have the right people in your circle of friends. Keep that in mind. But I'll, I'll turn this over to Mr. Enriquez, I believe. Yes, yes, yes. All right. Uh, next we have Mr. Ismael Enriquez. Let's give him a hand. Well, I, uh, I guess I bring a different perspective, but a lot of similar uh, experiences when Mr. Hawkins talked about family values, uh, people who influenced me as I was growing up. I was born in Texas from the age of nine until I was 18. I was a migrant worker. I lived in, this, in Michigan, Ohio, Indiana, Illinois, Florida, Tennessee, and finally we settled here in 1983. I started as a migrant worker when I was nine. I ended, like I said, when I was 18, and I was a high school dropout by that point. And um, every time we went to a different migrant camp, the first thing my father always did was put me in school. I hated it. I didn't want to go to school. I hated being, especially when I came up north, um, being the only Hispanic in many cases, looking out into an audience or in a classroom and never seeing somebody that looked like me. And so it was a difficult transition. And so when I dropped out of high school, I was a senior, believe it or not, I said, I'm never going into another classroom ever again. I'm glad that part of my life is over. 11 years later, graduated from GVSU, and <laughs> I'm getting up at quarter to six in the morning to drive 35 miles to go teach Spanish at a, at a suburban, uh, predominantly white school in Grand Rapids. So that in itself was another culture shock for me. So, like Mr. Hawkins has said so eloquently, uh, my why was my parents, my family. I didn't know when I started here at MCC at the age of 20 uh, what I wanted to do. I started out here at MCC to be a TV repairman, thinking that's what I was going to do for the rest of my life. Um, a year later, I dropped out and I thought to myself again, I'm never walking back into another classroom. Fortunately, I had people who inspired me, who motivated me, who told me just go back, don't give up. And um, like somebody said, and I could relate to, I was too dumb to stop. 
and I kept going, and it took me eight years to get my bachelor's degree, but I got it in, uh, in the end, and uh, never looked back. So that's it for now. Okay, next we have our MCC our Provost, Executive Vice President, Dr. John Selman. Okay, I was just going to try to stay right here. Can you hear from this mic here? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Well, well, thank you. I'm looking forward to hearing the rest of the stories up here, too. This sounds exciting. I think you'll see that there are going to be similar experiences here, um, family, work, education. Uh, but somebody made a difference uh, for all of us up here, and I'm sure somebody's going to make a difference for all of you. Um, my message is really one person can make the difference, and we should all try. Um, again, one person that can make the difference, but we, we should all try. And the ability to dream. You know, all of us, and I think about the, the, some of our great athletes and so many other folks that are extremely talented. Um, and the, probably the thing that we all have in common with those folks is our ability to dream. Um, I dreamed about college, about being successful, and lo and behold, I started to behave <coughs> like I wanted to be a college graduate. I started to do things along the way that would get me along this pathway, and I think the ability to dream, we'll talk a little bit more about that when, when we come back after lunch, because I know that we got about four minutes before lunch here. So, But anyway, I think that but with family, school and work, similar paths, similar journeys you'll hear up here, but some thing or somebody made the difference. And so again, and I think you'll experience that in your life where either you can make a difference for somebody or somebody's gonna make a difference for you, but the deal is that they tried. And so we'll talk a little bit more about that um, after lunch. So. And next we have the Honorable Judge Gregory Pittman. <clears throat> Good morning. Um, you know, you sit in a, in a meeting like this and you get to meet wonderful men like this panel <clears throat> and women when women are involved. And you, you, you hear commonalities, you hear some differences in people's paths to where they are. One of the things that uh, is different from everybody else here is <clears throat> they all have come to Muskegon in some manner to invest in Muskegon. I'm a homeboy. I'm a Heights, Heights kid, class of 79, born, raised on Reardon Street. And the thing that I think you will find as you are paying attention here is that the story may be a lot different from place to place, but it's really a whole lot the same. It's really the, a whole lot the same. There's nothing that is disqualifying about being from Muskegon that uh, stops you from being what it is that you decide that you want to be. That's my part here, to be that particular example. Um, <clears throat> some of the commonalities here, and, and we'll leave, I'm not going to get into what I'm going to talk about. We'll talk about that when we get back. But So we've got a... Uh, we got a blind pig, we got a bootlegger, my father ran a liquor store. We used to sell the liquor to the blind pigs. Uh, my brother would deliver it on his way to his law enforcement job, literally in his uniform. And <laughs> You don't have to be gangster to become, uh, <laughs> to, to become uh, uh, successful. But I think what they're trying to say, and what we're all trying to say, is that circumstance does not di uh, dictate your ultimate destiny. It absolutely does not do that. Finally, uh, these two fine noobs here, you go get about three, four more, and then it will equal up to the one Q that's uh, here with you guys. <laughs> And, uh, and I think the odds will be just about even. <laughs> it's going to be a pleasure. Listen, young, young people, every opportunity you get to have an atmosphere where people are sharing not only uh, their knowledge and their experience, but they're sharing their hearts and their souls with you, don't take it lightly. Don't make this pro forma. 
don't make this a matter where you say, I'm just going to endure, I'm going to get through, and that's going to be another four hours that I put into doing something. This is an opportunity at lunch, uh, at a break, wherever, to step up and ask a question, any question, and allow these people, allow us, to be able to invest in you just like we were invested in by somebody else some time ago. None of us become who we are by ourselves. This is the opportunity for you to begin to get a deposit from somewhere else that eventually is going to earn interest and grow and become a great balance for you as you move forward. Make it count. Thank you.